Okay. I'd like to welcome you all for another edition of Quantum Computation and Isolation. So today I'm very happy to be introducing uh, Yi Ching uh, uh, Zhou. Um, she got her bachelor's degree in engineering physics and computer science in 2020. And she is currently a PhD student um, at Cornell University starting in 2020. From May 9, 2019 to August 2019, she was an intern at Flatiron Institute Center for Computational Physics, uh, uh, Quantum Physics in New York City. And from May 2020 to August 2020, she was an intern at Zapata Computing in Boston. And today she'll be talking about what limits the simulation of quantum computers. Um, so please help me in welcoming either by unmuting yourselves or by clapping virtually, eating a job. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for the invitation and also for the introduction. So today I'd like to talk about our uh, published work, uh, What Limits the Simulation of Quantum Computers? And uh, the paper link is here. If you are interested in some more details, you can take a look at the paper. Uh, so this work was uh, in collaboration with uh, Miles Studemeyer and Xavier Wentel. And it was initiated while I was an intern at the Flatiron Institute and a uh, student at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So now I've moved to Cornell University. Just want to acknowledge all the supports I've got. Um, okay, so. First, I'd like to uh, talk about the motivation and background of our work and why we want to ask and uh, like try to answer the question of what limits the simulation of quantum computers. So as many of you probably um, already knew or even looked into the details of this paper, um, there have been lots of exciting developments um, in quantum computing experiments. And among them, there's one paper uh, from 2019 published by the Google group where they uh, claim that they've demonstrated uh, the quantum supremacy by finishing a task that cannot be finished by cl classical computers in a reasonable amount of time. So the task they uh, performed is actually drawing samples from uh, random quantum circuits. And their configuration is they have 53 qubits, they ran a circuit of depth 20, and they got a fidelity, which they used the uh, linear cross entropy benchmark as their uh, metric. They got a fidelity of um, 0.002. So we'll get more, uh, back to this random quantum circuit more later. But um, apart from this amazing experiment they've done uh, by this team, they also performed very involved uh, classical simulations trying to figure out how good their uh, quantum de device is uh, performing. So they uh, used very, so they developed some uh, advanced classical simulation algorithm. And based on their calculations, they extrapolated that to finish such a task on a classical computer, it will take 10,000 years, which is uh, extrapolated here. So shortly after uh, this nature paper, came out, there's another group uh, from IBM where they said they're able to uh, perform a task, uh, the same task within a couple of days using the state-of-the-art supercomputer. So we can see there's a drastic difference between 10,000 years and a few days. So that naturally leads to the question of, um, sorry, what is the true difficulty of simulating a quantum computer? So yes, before I get into details of our work, I'd like to give you a context of what has uh, been done on the classical simulation side. So there has actually been lots of work on uh, classical simulations. And uh, the baseline of all these previous works um, is that all these algorithms scale exponentially with some parameter. Uh, whether it's number of qubits, circuit depths, or some of the algorithms are uh, tailored for certain types of circuits. So they can say scale exponentially in number of non clifford gates. And I'd like to highlight that all these uh, simulations are doing exact uh, classical simulations, by which I mean they are e either trying to get a final state with fidelity one, or they are drawing, drawing samples from the uh, exact distribution. And however, on the, other hand, on, on the other hand, we know that quantum computers have a finite fidelity. So 
when we are trying to compare the capability of classical hardware and a quantum processor. Um, to put them on the like a uh, equal footing, we probably should not be so harsh on the classical hardwares where um, maybe we should consider allowing the classical hardwares to also make some mistakes. So here, can we do approximate classical simulations, which means um, on the classical computer, we also get a state that with fidelity uh, smaller than one. So let me now uh, talk about our uh, approximate quantum circuit simulation algorithm. So to do approximate quantum circuit simulation, there uh, are mainly two parts. First, we want to know how to approximately represent a quantum state, and we want to know how to run the quantum circuit approximately. Let's start with um, the, how, how to represent the quantum state. So, Actually, uh, the main idea for approximating uh, the state is the same as when people are trying to compress the quantum state when they are studying like many body physics or in other contexts when people try to uh, compress a general high order tensor. So in this case, we are looking at a quantum computer with n qubits. So we can express the wave function in the computational basis where this Q1 all the way to Qn is just uh, a certain bit string, um, and we are in, on the classical memory. We are trying to store this uh, amplitude tensor, and we can see that it, it has actually uh, lots of indices, so it's a really high order tensor. But we know that some basis states are more important than others, which means uh, some of the amplitude is uh, much larger than others. So we can try to keep important states and discard others, and this is uh, what. Tensor network states is trying to do, and here we, uh, in this work, we consider the matrix product state or MPS, and this is the one D case of a, a tensor network state. Uh, one can consider more complicated things, but we just want to uh, get started with the simplest one uh, D matrix product state. And before I start sketching out how uh, we our algorithm works, I like to introduce this. Uh, give a brief introduction to tensor networks and showing you how, uh, what a tensor network diagram looks like. And in a later part of this talk, I will use the tensor network diagrams a lot. So uh, the simplest thing we, we might want to represent is a scalar, which is, uh, a, you can think of it as a tensor with zero indices. Um, and it, it is just, uh, it, it, it can be represented by just one vertex with no outpointing edges. And if one wants to represent a vector which has one index in this tensor network diagram language, we put uh, one vertex and have one uh, edge pointing out. So this is uh, how we re represent the vector vi. So if, and we, al we also can consider matrices, uh, for example, this mij, we have two indices, so it's one vertex with two uh, index. And of course, we can generalize this idea to um, a very high order tensor. Here, I just give an example of, say, uh, order five tensor. And the tensor, tensor networks are just composed of all these type of elements. And uh, the network means these elements are connected in a certain way. So on the right-hand side, I just show uh, one simple example of tensor network. Suppose we, uh, so mathematically we have this expression which is written in the um, Einstein notation where all the common indices K, L and uh, K and L are summed over. And uh, when, when we multiply these two tensors, we uh, ended up with this uh, new tensor C. So as, as we consider higher order tensors, this mathematical expression can be really complicated. But if we uh, use uh, tensor network diagrams, this provides a really good way to visualize what's going on. So we start with two separate tensors um, and we connect the K and L edges and we do the contraction. And at the end, we ended up with a C uh, tensor with only indices I, J, and M. Okay, so let me uh, remind you that what we are trying to represent is this high order uh, amplitude tensor. And this intensive uh, diagram looks just like one node with lots of uh, edges pointing out. 
So the question is how to compress this tensor? Uh, what, uh, what, what is a very important method and uh, most com commonly used to compress a high order tensor is to do approximation with singular value decomposition, where uh, we can first consider a bipartite system, psi AB, and we do the SVD where we split it into uh, uh, USV uh, multiplied together. And uh, we can see uh, once we do the singular value decomposition, the middle part uh, S mu is the singular values. And it can go from all the way from one to chi four, which means uh, there is a total of chi four non zero uh, singular values. And we can do some sorting. So as mu is put into a sorted uh, form where we have the larger singular values on the top and the smallest at the bottom. So to do the approximation, what we do is we only keep uh, the chi largest singular values and discard all the remaining parts. So typically we have chi smaller or equal to four. In a uh, tensor diagram, we, we have, uh, we start with this tensor with a, b, um, two indices, and we like pull them apart. And in the middle of this uh, orange diamond means this singular value uh, vector. And we do the compression where we uh, replace this orange, um, like full singular value vector with this truncated version. And we can absorb this uh, singular value uh, vector or the diagonal matrix into either side of this uh, A or B and then end up in this uh, expression. So we here we have this initial full state and after compression, um, this we, we get this compressed state. So this is how we do approximation by SVD. And we can actually do a sequence of SVD to uh, pull, uh, make, make this um, high order tensor into a chain of uh, matrices with only, uh, or tensors with only one qubit per site. So here we start with a large tensor, we pull out one qubit at a time and ended up with this 1D chain format. And this is the uh, matrix product state form. So you might want to ask why bother doing all these SVDs because this just seems to be a lot of work to um, perform such kind of decomposition. So this actually, this uh, NPS form actually brings us a lot because initially when we want to represent this high order um, tensor in full, we have, um, we need to uh, afford an exponential cost where the memory requirement scales as two to the N. But once we put it into this matrix product state form, this is actually polynomial in number of qubits. It only takes N chi square. Uh, so, here the, we can see the only controlling parameter of MPS is the bound dimension chi, where we can uh, choose how, how large a bound dimension we want to keep. And this is closely related that, to the accuracy uh, we can get. So as chi goes to the exponential two to n, we will see that the MPS becomes exact. So hereby we see how to do the controlled compression of a quantum state. And uh, let's now turn to the circuit side. So on the, once we, we know how to represent the state, um, let's see how we can apply the, uh, the gates onto that state. So actually for single qubit state, it, it's relatively simple because uh, the matrix uh, or the matrix only applies onto one circuit, uh, one qubit, sorry one qubit, um, which this qubit is just pulling out one of the uh, sites from, from the MPS. And we basically simply do the contraction and we ended up with an updated site. We just put it back to uh, the MPS to So we uh, now have an updated state. But for the two qubit gate, uh, things are not as easy and we cannot do exact uh, contraction because otherwise the bound dimension will blow up. So we have to do some sort of uh, some approximation use that uh, SVD. So let's see how, how things works. Uh, when we try to apply a two qubit gate onto uh, two neighboring sites, we still do the same contraction. We ended up with this gray uh, tensor. We can see that these two qubits are actually merged. So we want, we want because we want to restore the MPS form, we need to do a cut um, here. So we perform the SVD and we, uh, 
but we, we need to do some truncation to make sure the bound dimension uh, stays the same. And we ended up with uh, two sides, but this is only uh, approximated, uh, approximately equal. So this is the only source of error in our um, approximated simulation algorithm. And in, in the later discussion of the, uh, how well our algorithm works, we actually only consider uh, two cubic gate error. And uh, because first our uh, one cubic gate application is exact. And second, just um, this also matches what happens in experiments very well. Uh, because in experiments, uh, when you actually work with quantum computers, you'll see the single qubit um, fidelity is much higher than the two cubic gate fidelity. Okay, so here I've uh, sketched, like laid out how uh, our approximate quantum circuit simulation works. We, we know how to approximate the state. We know how to do the gate application. And let me just state this explicitly that we can see all these, uh, this algorithm costs linearly in uh, N and D. This is very similar to what happens in actual uh, quantum hardware. Okay, so now let's try to apply this algorithm to some, some task, which the task we considered is motivated by uh, the, the experiments, which is the random quantum circuits. So let me bring back uh, the, what, what, what's been done in the experiments. So here in the supremacy experiments, they have a chip with 2D connectivity and they uh, consider random quantum circuit with certain uh, structure where they apply one layer of single qubit gate um, and then another layer of two qubit gates followed by uh, another layer of uh, single qubit gate. So they continue uh, single qubit gate, two qubit gate, and they continue on. So their single qubit gates are uh, randomly chosen from these three type of uh, gates, where, which is uh, root X, root Y, and root uh, W. And they also, for the two qubit gate, it's the fixed type of gate, which is the ice walk gate. So the, the purpose of the random quantum circuit is to build up entanglement rapidly, and it, it, it is designed to be hard to simulate classically. And uh, probably there is, at least as far as I know, there is no uh, realistic application of random quantum circuits uh, trying to solve any realistic problem, apart from trying to uh, demonstrate this quantum supremacy. But um, so just want to point out that uh, this is what's built to be hard to simulate. And uh, our, the circuit we consider is slightly different from what, uh, what has been done in experiments, but it's motivated based on that. So we start with looking at a 1D structure where basically we consider a chain of qubits with nearest neighboring uh, coupling. And uh, we, we use the same circuit structure where we apply one layer of single qubit gates and uh, we couple uh, odd pair of nearest neighbors. We apply another layer of single qubit gate and we uh, add another layer to coupling the remaining uh, even pair of uh, nearest neighbors. So after this, uh, this up to depth two, we uh, have all the nearest neighbors coupled and we repeat this pattern. So the single qubit gate we consider uh, is just random unitary rotation without the restriction on uh, only the three, uh, we don't have the restriction of the uh, root X, root Y and root uh, w, we just choose the random single qubit rotation. And uh, for the two qubit gates, we can main, mainly consider control Z and control X. We also tried iSwap, but essentially in our simulation algorithm, the type of gates doesn't influence how the algorithm works because it's just changing the uh, data within that two qubit gate tensor but the accuracy actually depends on the type of gate and I'll get back to this later. And just a note that uh, from now on, I will use N to represent number of qubits and D to represent the depth of the circuit. So first, let me show you uh, our results and like observation on a 1D quantum circuit. So uh, the first thing we are trying to um, 
see as how accurate our algorithm can work on uh, 1D connectivity. So there are multiple possible choice of metric we can use. Um, for example, we have the multi uh, qubit fidelity or we have the uh, linear cross entropy benchmark uh, used by the experimentalists. But uh, here, because we, we uh, already, we, we can com compute the fidelity fairly conveniently uh, using our algorithm. So we just used uh, fidelity on uh, our benchmark. And actually fidelity is relatively more uh, sensitive to the error. So let, let me remind you that the, in our case, the only source of error is from the two qubit gates. So here, let's look at the two qubit gate fidelity first. Uh, the two qubit gate, gate fidelity defined by this uh, lowercase f um, at uh, a certain two qubit gate we have, uh, we just do an inner product between uh, the perfect resulting state of after at the uh, applying this n gate um, to the approximated resulting state after that gate application. And we do a square. So one good nice feature of MPS is that if you put it into a canonical form, I, I will not uh, talk about details here, but just want to uh, just want to mention this. Uh, this the two qubit fidelity can be conveniently calculated just by looking at the singular values. So that that means basically uh, our fidelity just comes uh, without too much effort because as we do the uh, SVD, we already have a spectrum of all the singular values. So uh, the two qubit fidelity is just uh, the keeped. Uh, the capped singular values um, summed and squared summed uh, divided by the whole uh, singular values um, squared and summed. So, but we know uh, what we actually want to look at um, is the multi qubit fidelity. So let's see. Here, we, uh, I show you this uh, definition of multi qubit fidelity, where we are just trying to take an inner product of the truncated simulation result into the perfect simulation result. And you immediately see that there is a caveat here where um, this perfect simulation result is involved in, this, in the definition of multi qubit fidelity. But exact simulation is very expensive. And with, with all the effort uh, from uh, previous work, we are still only able to do uh, simulation um, smaller than like about 50 qubits. Um, and that already involves using really a state of the art classical hardware. So, uh, but can we, can we get multi qubit uh, fidelity from two qubit fidelity then? So we can avoid actually calculating the perfect simulation result. And fortunately the answer is yes. So here, let's see the link between uh, two qubit gate and uh, two qubit and multi qubit fidelity. So let me bring back this uh, definition of multi qubit fidelity. And if you think about uh, the how the error accumulates in uh, the circuit, you will expect that the fidelity to be multiplicative because every time you apply gate, you lose certain fidelity, and as you go on, the, the error will just uh, accumulate. So here we write down this hypothesis where, where we um, guess that the multi qubit fidelity will just be um, all the two qubit gate fidelities multiplied together. And we justify that this hypothesis is very accurate um, using numerical simulations. So on the right hand side in this plot, uh, we compare uh, the results from the exact definition of multi qubit fidelity and this approximation. So all these, all these markers, the dots, the plus, the cross are from uh, the definition of multi qubit fidelity, where we uh, carry out exact simulation for n to the 20, uh, like 20 qubit simulations, which is still affordable. So we calculated the perfect simulated state and we do the inner product to get all these markers. And as we do the approximated simulation, we also record it down uh, the two qubit gate fidelity at each step and we multiply them together, that gives us the lines. So we can see basically the lines and the markers agree uh, perfectly. That means um, this, this uh, form can help us estimate uh, 
the multi-qubit fidelity very if efficiently um, by just looking at the two qubit gate fidelity. And this is a great news because now we can do large scale, large N, large D um, simulations and still evaluate the accuracy. And let, let's still take a closer look at this figure and if uh, we can still make several more observations. So you might notice that this, uh, all these curves fall into two regimes. The first part is where um, the fidelity remains one um, and before it starts to uh, drop. And this initial plateau is uh, actually caused by the fact that the bound dimension is not saturated yet. So when we uh, choose the maximal bound dimension, um, we are saying like we are allow the wave function to uh, the entanglement to grow a little bit until the bound dimension reaches that, that cap we want to uh, keep. And afterwards we'll do truncation. But before that, all the simulation, are, simulation like the gate applications are exact. That gives us this initial plateau. And if you look, look to the large D uh, region, we can see that the fidelity of F drops exponentially because uh, the curve just falls onto the straight line and we are plotting a, a log scale. So this actually resembles what happens in uh, real quantum computers because in real quantum computers, every time you apply a gate, you lose some uh, fidelity and all these just accumulates in our uh, in this in accumulates and uh, reflects in the resulting final state. So, if you uh, look closer to this uh, plot, you might want to compare these three uh, colored lines, and you notice that it seems like when we increase the bond dimension from ten to twenty to fifty, the curve is pushed up um, a, a bit. And you might ask how far can we push up the curve? Because ideally, if we can push the curve all the way up and make it almost flat, then this is great because we're basically doing very high accuracy classical simulations. But uh, actually, actually uh, th there is some good and some bad news. Uh, and I'll talk about this in detail here. So if you look at the small system or shallow circuit, we can see that uh, here we are looking at the uh, averaged uh, two qubit gate error or just one minus the two qubit gate fidelity versus the bound dimension chi. So if we look at small system shallow circuits, uh, we can see that increasing bound dimension really helps a lot where the error just keeps decreasing as we double the bound dimensions. But uh, I just want to point out that this is basically a finite size effect. And because we are uh, for a small system, uh, when we keep larger bound dimension, the previous plateau just extends further. And when we do, uh, well, when we do the averaging over the fidelity, uh, that's the uh, finite size effect that brings us this drop. And if you look at uh, relatively larger system here uh, where and deep, deeper circuits, which here we have uh, circuit depths 100. Um, you can see that when, when we double the uh, chi, the curve doesn't seem to uh, drop down as fast as, as we see on this blue curve. And, if, and we can actually extrapolate uh, what happens in the uh, infinite limit where when we ex depth infinite limit, what we do is we discard the plateau part and we just look at where the, the fidelity starts to decay, which means we only count the uh, two qubit gate sets uh, applied after the bound dimensions saturated. So in this infinite uh, circuit depth limit, we can see we get a pretty good fidelity um, with a relatively small bound dimension, say 128 here. So this is a good news, which means uh, with a relative reasonable bound dimension, we can do pretty high accuracy simulation. But the bad news is um, this uh, fidelity very soon saturates to a certain value, which we call this uh, epsilon infinity or uh, fidelity subscript infinity. So that means even though we are dumping in a uh, much larger bound dimensions, say we are doubling it, the curve, uh, the effective 
error rate is still uh, not decreased um, as much as we hope. So th this is why I said it's, it's good news. At the same time, it's a bad news. And actually, the existence of this plateau um, in or the existence of this epsilon infinity is not a coincidence. And th it can be understood from a random matrix theory perspective. So the, intu the intuition here is that the random quantum circuit really scrambles the state and makes each, uh, like in, in MPS, each matrix becomes really structureless. So uh, random matrix theory is uh, applicable here. And we introduce this Gaussian tensor ensemble, which basically means we are randomly drawing samples. Um, we are randomly drawing tensors from this um, an ensemble with this expression. And roughly speaking, it's the elements uh, or the numbers within the tensor is just drawn randomly. So here we uh, try to apply two group gate to a matrix drawn from the Gaussian tensor ensemble, and we do SVD and in inspect the, its singular values. So on the right-hand side, what we are, we are plotting is basically a spectrum of singular values. And we can see that uh, though there's a lot of curves, but basically all the curves are bundled into uh, two curves, uh, one uh, which is this one, and another one is uh, below it, slightly below it. And this is uh, mainly due to uh, the fact that the, for the two qubit gates of our interest, there are, uh, they can be divided into two groups. One, they have rank two, and one, they have rank four. So um, let, let's, there actually is, a, and th this two curves actually explains why uh, the, we, we see that plateau on previous slide. So actually, we can think about increasing the bound dimension as going to a continuum limit, where, uh, as defined before, the two qubit gate fidelity is defined by summing over the uh, capped singular value squared divided by this re uh, renormalization factor. And once we uh, increase the bound dimension, so we get a really uh, high resolution where mu goes from one to say infinity, and that just turns the thing into an integral. And because we see th th these, uh, thing, these curves just fall into uh, a certain shape, and this shape is like a, just a distribution, we, we, we didn't solve for what maybe analytically one can get a form, but we just generally say this shape is represented by this function gx. For, some, uh, for certain function gx, it describes the spectrum of the singular values. And what, what we are getting, uh, so in the continuum limit, we can get that uh, the fidelity we'll get um, is just integrating from zero to one, uh, which is we are keeping half of the singular values and uh, divided by integrating from zero to two. So basically we are saying we are keeping the top half of the singular values and discarding these smaller ones. So, uh, if you look at this expression, you can see that this is independent of the bound dimension chi. That's why uh, when, despite the when chi is very small, then uh, this continuum limit doesn't really apply. But once chi gets large enough, um, further adding chi is just an increasing the resolution of uh, the cut here. But uh, when, when you do the integral, um, we still get the same. Uh, resulting to that with some fluctuation at the edge, but that then um, like influence the long-term or like infinite deep circuit simulation result. So uh, we use this random, uh, use this Gaussian tensor ensemble, and we found that in this, uh, in the continuum limit, this uh, fidelity Gaussian tensor ensemble for rank two tensors um, are approximately uh, 96.1%. And for rank four, it, it becomes lower because uh, to keep the bound dimension fixed, we are not, uh, we are now like integrating from zero to four. And that gives us 93.2% fidelity. And th this actually agrees very well with our uh, actual circuit simulation. 
So here, uh, we, we show the agreement between the MPS circuit simulation and the Gaussian ensemble, tensor ensemble uh, test. So the colored lines um, are data points uh, drawn from the MPS circuit simulation. And um, this black dashed line um, is for a tensor drawn from tensor, uh, Gaussian tensor ensemble. And you can ignore this uh, dotted line if you're curious what this dotted line is doing, you can look into the uh, paper for details. But the, the point is that uh, for different uh, bound dimension chi, um, 2400, 800, we always get a converge to a similar uh, shape as this Gaussian tensor ensemble uh, singular value spectrum. So that, that also, that explains why um, when we double the uh, chi, we are not uh, getting much increase in the uh, fidelity. So um, as many people are curious um, and uh, which makes this thing kind of more exciting is can we actually apply this to the 2D uh, quantum circuit as done in the uh, actual experiments? So yes, we tried, tried to apply this uh, MPS-based algorithm to uh, 2D random quantum circuits. And the standard way to map a 2D grid onto a 1D chain is to snake it through this uh, 2D lattice structure where we just put this qubits, one, two, three, four, five, and we um, start from the next column, six, six, seven, eight, nine, and we put it onto the 1D chain. But there is a obvious problem that um, some two grid, two qubit gates that's uh, local on this 2D configuration, uh, 2D grid becomes non-local on the uh, MPS. Say so this one and uh, the first and the sixth uh, qubit are uh, nearest neighbors on this 2D chip and we, they can apply, uh, experimentalists can apply two qubit gates directly on, on them. But in the MPS case, um, they are separated by uh, the, these four uh, qubits. So the, the most direct uh, way to handle this condition is to use swap operations to actually bring the one and six onto uh, nearest neighboring sites on MPS. And then we apply the two qubit gate and move things back by applying another sequence of swap gates. But that that means uh, when we do one uh, two qubit gate, like uh, effective two qubit gate application, we are uh, actually doing uh, a lot more uh, truncation than before. So that makes effective fidelity very low. So in general, 2D uh, connectivity is much harder than the 1D connectivity to uh, simulate. So is there anything we can do to make our 1D like MPS uh, simulation algorithm work uh, on the work better on 2D configurations? So the main idea is to avoid truncation. So what, what we did is to group multiple qubits into uh, one side in MPS. So initially we put uh, one qubit on uh, each MPS site, but here now we have for each MPS site, we are uh, containing like multiple uh, qubits. So that effectively internalizes some of the two big qubit gates. Originally, every time we have a two qubit gate, we need to do some sort of truncation, but here uh, some of the two qubit gates uh, applies two qubit within one cluster then that um, two qubit gate application just becomes exact. But uh, you'll see the problem is that um, grouping multiple qubits uh, into a cluster costs exponentially because originally uh, here we only have two, but here uh, this combined uh, bond becomes two to the say, if you have uh, n qubits in this cluster, it's two to the n. But that did make our uh, algorithm work um, on 2D systems. So here I'm, I'm showing what, what uh, one of the configurations we did uh, where we uh, combined columns of qubits into one uh, MPS cluster. For example, here, this is an example of we call 3333 uh, configuration where just uh, each cluster contains three columns. And there's something uh, 
like can make our life even better, which is the shifting scheme. So we uh, we can move back and forth between two type of configurations, for example, the three, 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 and five, two, five. And uh, this further reduces the time we need to perform a uh, truncation. And that, that's also related to the fact that the uh, uh, random quantum circuit has a certain type of structure. So let's first start with looking at uh, the control Z, uh, the, the case where the two qubit gate is chosen to be control Z gates. And we know because this is a rank two, uh, two qubit gate, this is uh, relatively easier than the uh, I swap gates. So here we didn't use the shifting scheme. We only use this grouping uh, qubit uh, trick. And we can see uh, when we use different configurations, uh, the, when we change the way we group the qubits, there is some trade-off between uh, how large a bond dimension we need to keep. And of course, once we uh, group them into larger clusters, it, these kind of points also cost more compared with these, these type of points. So the, this, uh, let me just point out that this dashed blue line represents uh, the fidelity um, when the experimentalists get from their supremacy experiment. Um, and just one comment, um, I'm now ignoring the difference between the linear uh, cross entropy benchmark and fidelity. So we can see like, for example, for points here, uh, we are able to get a fidelity comparable to experiments. And uh, which is uh, with an average gate fidelity of 98.6. So, uh, and we also try to apply uh, this scheme to a uh, circuit with I swap two qubit gates. And um, because this is a rank four tensor, life actually becomes harder. So we uh, initially observed that um, just using grouping, we only get a two qubit gate fidelity average um, to a approximately 95%. And that, that's uh, a sharp drop compared with uh, what we previously get from control Z gates. So um, we added on this shifting scheme to further reduce the time we do SVD approximation and we um, get our fidelity back to 98%. But uh, as shown on this figure, this orange line is an uh, extrapolation of uh, how the relation between uh, fidelity or the error versus bound dimension. And we haven't actually get to this point where uh, we actually matches the supremacy experiment. But um, he will predict that if we are able to go to chi uh, on the order of 10 to the fourth, then we probably will be able to uh, reach the, a comparable fidelity. So there can be some more work done on this. Uh, we didn't use any uh, parallelization or um, advanced tensor network methods. So there is still room for exploration. So, Finally, uh, after presenting our results, I'd like to talk about, uh, just give a conclusion and a short summary. So in this talk, I've uh, showed our MPS-based algorithm, um, which enables approximate classical simulation of quantum circuits. And uh, this algorithm actually mimics uh, real quantum devices because first, it, the cost scales linearly in number of qubits and depths. And uh, we reached finite fidelity um, at each gate operation. So for 1D random circuits, we can reach up to 99% fidelity, um, which also takes into the, the initial plateau uh, finite size effect into account, of course. Um, and for the 2D random circuits, uh, we got lower fidelity, um, but we used some other tricks to move the fidelity back up to 98% as shown in previous slide. So finally, I'd like to get back to the title. Um, so what limits the simulation of quantum computers? So our answers are um, it's fidelity and connectivity. So let me remind you that for fidelity, we observed a, a limit on the uh, epsilon in the infinite uh, limit. So for um, fidelity that's uh, lower than this, this uh, bound, we are able to do simulation uh, with a linear cost, but going beyond that uh, fidelity, 
requests uh, much uh, much more effort. And secondly, um, as you might notice, uh, as we move from the 1D circuit to the 2D circuit, things are becoming much more uh, painful. So that means definitely 2D is much harder than 1D to simulate. And if uh, one can improve the connectivity in their uh, quantum processor, that is um, poses a much uh, larger challenge on the classical side. So with that, I'll just leave uh, the link to the paper here. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone for your attention. And I'm ready to take questions. OK. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can either raise their hand or they can um, just unmute themselves and ask. Okay, so uh, may, oh, yes, Brayden. Hi, yeah. Um, I guess but my first question is, um, is, there, is there some evidence of a phase transition between at a sort of a finite uh, fidelity or a finite, um, uh, yeah, and? Yeah, uh, so actually uh, we, we think this uh, epsilon infinity kind of defines the phase transition here where uh, when, when we are below the, uh, or let, let's use fidelity in, in, instead. When we want a lower fidelity than this uh, defined by this limit, this is relatively uh, easier region where it's cost just linearly. But once we want to get beyond that, it's a phase transition from linear to something that will uh, lead to exponential cost. So yes. Uh, yeah, well, one, one follow up. Um, I guess maybe one thing that uh, people um, are studying is, uh, they're studying like uh, maybe noisy circuits or circuits with non mm -hmm. non unitary gates, for example. Um, and you can imagine, you know, making rather than simulating the unitary evolution, simulate the non unitary evolution and try to see if there's a phase transition, uh, you know, a, a related phase transition in the same, you know, at the oh. same noise threshold or or something. Uh, I, oh. I, I I'm just wondering if you had considered things like that and whether you would think that would be similar. Yeah, uh, actually I've noticed there has been, have been several works that uses like matrix product operators um, to represent the, say the density matrix and that can uh, simulate the actual noise. So yeah, uh, I believe there, there can be interesting works also down there. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, so um, I actually had a question. So mm -hmm. your work basically puts a limit on, um, puts a limit on how, to how far we can simulate a quantum computer. Does this then translate to um, what quantum say materials we could simulate or some any body system? Uh, yes, so like there has been uh, people working on how to use uh, classical, no, sorry, quantum computers to uh, simulate say quantum, other quantum systems. Mm -hmm. And um, all these algorithms are, can be directly like translated to this classical simulator. So basically if we, you want a fidelity that's lower than uh, this threshold and you consider the quantum computer and this our classical simulator as just two black boxes then it's really hard to tell what's the difference between uh, bit strings or samples generated from um, these two black boxes. Mm -hmm. So you, you can just, if, if, that, uh, if the requirement for the fidelity for, for those uh, quantum materials algorithms are not too high, like above this threshold, then you can basically do this sort of classical simulation and still explore how well this kind of quantum algorithm works. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then a somewhat, uh, it's unrelated question, it might be a little bit naive, but how is the 3D case hopeless? Because you said 2D is much more difficult in one day. So would 3D then be beyond hope? Oh, yes. So you mean on the classical side? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so actually, uh, so on the classical side for the tensor network methods, 
people are still uh, working on improving the 2D case, which they call the uh, PAPS, mm -hmm. which is a 2D tensor network, uh, tensor network. But for 3D, um, th there has been some work using 3D tensor networks, but it, it is really a rare case. And it, it's hard because you, you just each uh, node connects to too many uh, nearest neighbors and you really cannot have a large bond dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions? So maybe I'll wait about five seconds if anybody wants to unmute. Okay. So let's thank Yichang again. Thank you.